All right, so as I mentioned in the announcements, the month of March, and today's March 1st, we are uh, doing another challenge. We've been doing challenges for the past year, and we're going to continue doing those challenges. We're focusing on different aspects of our spiritual life, and this month we'll be focusing on trying to uh, identify areas of our life where we are wasting time. This is kind of the best way to do it. We're just wasting time, wasting our precious time that we have in this life, doing things that ultimately don't matter at all. And I, and I said this this morning, you know, I'm not against some forms of entertainment or winding down and kind of resetting so that you don't just burn yourself out. You need to be able to have some level of, of being able to do things you know, whether it just be, you know, enjoying your family, playing a game with your family, doing things like that. This isn't, you know, the sermon isn't just to try to get you, like, so rigid like you're in a prison or something where you're just, you know, this is the way it's going to be all the time and just hammer it down. But if you take a look at your life, I'm sure you'll be able to identify things that you're just like, you know what, this is just a total waste. This really isn't serving any good purpose. Or I'm just spending, even if it's not just bad, maybe in and of itself, it's just you're spending too much time on it, right? Maybe it's something you just need to scale back a little bit. You don't have to just completely eliminate from your life, but you realize, yeah, this is just, just a little bit too much. Or maybe you've got a sin, and that's something we did last year as well, is identify something that, that's just kind of sinful that you can just try to easily get out of your life, right? And you want to redeem the time. So that is what we're focusing on this month. And I kind of want to preach a little bit on that this morning. We started in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but if you want to keep your place there and flip over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I want you to look down in your Bibles at James chapter 4 and verse number 13. The Bible reads, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And the, the first point I want to make on this passage right here is that the Bible is referring to our lives as just being like a vapor, just a little puff of smoke, right? Just, a, just, it's here for a very brief period of time. And the older you get, the more you realize how fast time really does fly. And just day after day, time just continues to seem, and you know, in, in my years of life, it seems like when you're younger, you feel like you've got all the time in the world. You've just got nothing but time. I mean, you could just do whatever, and this is your perception of how things go. But the older you get, you realize, man, there is not enough time in the day. I need to get more things done. There's so many things I want to do. There's so much I want to accomplish, and there's just not enough time to do it. Your time is precious. And you know what? Time goes by at the same speed no matter how old or young you are. It's just your perception and how you view things. We need to be able to view the time. And the Bible saying here, our life. I mean, whatever your lifespan is, your average lifespan, it's just like a vapor. It appeareth for a short time, and then it vanishes away. It's gone. Uh, we're not here for very long, and this is implicating, hey, let's make use of the time that we have here because we're not here for very long. Let's try to make the best use of our time and not just waste it. So if you do end up in a situation where you can look back on your life, where you know, maybe you live a full life and you grow to be an old man or an old woman and you can look back on your life, you're not thinking, why did I spend so much time doing this and doing that and you know, going to movies and doing stupid stuff that I have nothing to show for it now? All this time I had and it was just invested in vanity, in just wastefulness and doing nothing. We ought to be able to look back on our life and say, hey, I accomplished this and I accomplished that. And I led people to the Lord and I served the Lord. You know, I, did, I did good things. So you can look back and say, I actually completed something and did something with my life. And my life had value. It's easy to get distracted and to get caught up in the things of this world and to just go off and do other things. But you know what? The things that this world has to offer are vanity. They hold no eternal value. 
And one of the other lessons that we can learn from James 4 here real, real briefly is that, you know, in the context, he's not as much focused on your life being a vapor, but he's, you know, the greater teaching here is he's, he's talking to people who are saying, oh yeah, today or tomorrow, we're gonna go in a city, we're gonna continue, you know, and just kind of bragging as if they had already done these things before they even doing, doing them, and assuming that they have the time to do them. They say, well, no, if the Lord will, we're gonna go and do this stuff, and we need to have, we'll let this sink in, right, is that don't put off service to the Lord, especially like, like younger kids, like, oh, I've got my whole life, you know, I'm going to go and do this now, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to have fun, I'm going to do all these things, and then later on, I'm going to get serious, later on, I'm going to go and do soul winning, later on, I'm going to do things that matter and are meaningful, but right now, I just want to just, just not do anything and just think about myself. And that's a bad attitude to have for many reasons, but one of them we see here is that you don't know, you know, what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what the next day is going to bring. People die at all ages. People breathe their last breath. Accidents, tragedies happen all the time. From the womb all the way up to, to you know, an, an aged person. You never know. People are losing their lives every day in their various ages. So you can't just assume just because things may, and you, know, you may be healthy, you may have everything going for you right now, no problems whatsoever. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know if some crazy person driving on the road here is going to slam into you head on and then you're, you're gone. Or you die of a heart attack or whatever. It happens unexpectedly. So we need to treat our life as being precious. We need to treat our time here on earth as being precious. And one of the reasons for that, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is because what we do in this life actually matters. It actually means something. I'm preaching to a room full of people who are saved, people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? Thank God for that. Praise the Lord for His mercy. Praise the Lord for the free gift of salvation that you didn't have to work for, that you didn't have to do anything for, that even if you lived an entire life of sin, but you put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, that He will save you, and He does save you, and you have eternal life. And praise God for that, that you're going to heaven, that you're going you're gonna to receive of the Lord that free gift of eternal life. However, it's way better if you can get saved earlier than maybe on your deathbed, right? Even though he does save you. And it's much better to be in heaven as opposed to being in hell. But just because you're saved, it doesn't mean that everything just stops there. Okay, we, we have this, people have this concept of like everything being equal. And, and sometimes I think the influence comes from like a socialist and communist type of an attitude of just thinking like, oh, everything needs to be, and you know, this is taught to the kids from a young age with the Barney and the, you know, I don't even know what's, what's really out there now that's, that's pushing this type of thing where everyone needs to just be equal, everything needs to be fair, you know what? It's not all, it's not, life isn't always equal and fair. And when we're talking about fair, you know, you have two different definitions of it. When I say, when I'm using disparagingly, you know, teaching children about being fair, it's just saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter what they do, what you do, you all are just going to get the same whatever, right? That's not fairness, but that's what people want to redefine fair to be is just, oh, well, everyone just gets the same amount of everything. No, how about the person who does the work and the person who's doing good and the person who's doing right, they're going to get more than the person who's not, right? right? And getting a, a, a just recompense or, or reward for what you're doing and because that is what God is going to do with us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see a reference here, what I believe a reference to the judgment seat of Christ because there's going to come a day, and, and we're not going to turn there, but you can look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talks about the judgment seat of Christ where you're going to be standing before the Lord and everyone's going to be judged on their works. Now, the judgment according to your works at the judgment seat of Christ is not to get into heaven because obviously being saved has nothing to do with our works. It's a free gift. But God at the second resurrection or at the resurrection, when, uh, when, we are, when Jesus Christ comes back and we receive our glorified bodies, we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we are going to receive for the things that were done in our bodies. 
So this life and the things that we do and the, the way that we spend our time does matter because there's going to be a recompense. There's going to be a reward for what you've done. And let's look down here at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to start reading again in verse number 8. The Bible reads, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So is everything going to be equal? No. You're going to receive according to your own labor. Now, is God going to, is God a respecter of persons? No. If two people work the same amount and do the same amount of labor, it doesn't matter who the individual is, they will be rewarded accordingly and equally because it doesn't matter who the person is, but the, the labor that you do does matter. Right. It's not just like, you know, even if someone gets saved and then they die, like the thief on the cross, he's not going to have a bunch of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. He's not just going to, it's not, it's not going to be the same as the guy who got saved maybe at a young age and served the Lord faithfully every day of his life or every week of his life, you know, whatever, and, and was doing a lot for, you know, that guy's going to get a lot more. Right. And that's right. And that's fair. And that's what the Bible teaches. We're going to receive according to his own labor. Verse number nine, for we are laborers together with God. And, you know, after a person gets saved, that's not the end. That's the beginning. We're laborers together with God. God wants to work with us. He wants to use us as his laborers, as his servants. It says, ye are God's husbandry. Amen. You know, someone to practice husbandry, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're raising animals to help do work, right? Like the oxen that's going to plow a field. We are like God's oxen. We're his workhorse. We're his mules. We're, we're those, those, that husbandry to go out and do the work of the Lord. And he's going to work with us. He doesn't just leave us alone. He's going to come. He's going to work with us. But he, that's what he wants us to do. We are to be laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's talking about, you know, I've laid the foundation. When Paul goes out and he gets people saved, he brings the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. You get saved, well, you're born again. You have a foundation, you have a rock of Jesus Christ that you are building thereupon. See, people that just have the foundation, they're still saved. They're going to heaven, right? Amen. The foundation's laid. It's done. It's there. And you know what? You can't remove the foundation. It's set in stone. It's, it is there. But how you build on that foundation is up to you. That's why he said, I've laid the foundation. Another man built it thereon. So other people are, are building on that foundation. It's like, hey, I went through. I preached the gospel. These people are getting saved. There's that foundation work. It's been laid. That's set. But I'm moving on. I've got to, you know, it's up to you to determine what are you going to build on that foundation? What are you going to do with your life? How are you going to spend your time? What are you going to build? Are you going to build things that last? Or are you going to build things that don't last, that are just going to be burned up, things that just don't really matter that well, using materials that won't last? Verse number 11, says, or verse number 12 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation good, excuse me, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. So notice, verse 12 says building, and it's giving that imagery of building on a foundation using different materials, right? If you're using gold and silver to build up, or precious stones, versus wood, hay, and stubble. Now, all of those materials you can use to build, right? He said, if any man build upon his foundation, but then it says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. So the building materials are being associated with the work that you do. So whatever work you're doing in this life, whatever work you're doing after you get saved is what you're building with. The work shall be made manifest. I mean, it's going to be made known. What did you do? For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. This is all imagery 
in symbolic, I, I don't believe that when you stand before the judgment of Christ, you're literally going to see like a wood house and stubble and then like this fire come and burn it up, right? That's not the point. The point is that it's, it's trying to show you that when you're using those types of materials, the wood, hay, and stubble, if you're going to try something by fire, that stuff's going to be burned up and disintegrate and go away and be turned into ash and turned into nothing, right? It's just going to be gone. It's going to be like, yeah, but look at how great I built this thing. I've made this huge tower, right? But if it's just made out of, out of wood, hay, and stubble, the fire is just going to destroy it. I mean, think about like, you know, if you make something out of Legos, you can make like this really cool, big, tall tower. Like, man, man, look how great. But then all it takes is for one two-year-old to come by and, you know, knock it over and then it's gone. And all that work that you just did building that Lego thing is destroyed, right? If you wanted to build something that's going to last longer, you're going to use some type of, of concrete or stone, right? I mean, you want to build something that's going to last. And that's where the, the, the contrast here is between the wood, hay, and stubble and the gold, silver, precious stones. Because if you're going to burn gold, silver, or precious stones, yeah, the gold or silver may melt, but it's still going to be there. It's still, you should still have exactly the same amount of what you started with. It's still, it still retains through the fire. And in fact, with gold and silver, it just gets purified and, and better when you try it through the fire, get rid of the dross, right? You, that's something that remains, and it's something that's valuable, and it's something that's going to continue on. And that's the, what, why this is being brought up. So he says, if in verse 14, when your works are tried by fire, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So when your works are tried, when you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, and all the works that you've done in your life are tried, the Bible says you're going to receive a reward for whatever remains. Everything you've done, anything that was good, anything that was valuable to, to the Lord, anything that's valuable to God, that you've done with your life, and it's work, okay, work that you've done, labor, not how you felt in your heart, not thoughts that you may have had that were good thoughts, work. I said, but God knows my heart. He does know your heart, and your intentions matter, but he's judging your works. He's not judging, you know, how you felt about things. He's judging what did you actually do? You were here for a time. What did you do at the time here? Who did you reach? Who did you impact? Because you know what matters to God are souls. Souls matter. How are you impacting people? That is what we need to be focused on. You know, unfortunately, too many people focus on physical things, on property, on money, on things that ultimately, like the wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to burn up. That's right. You know, the old adage, you can't take it with you. You can't. When you die, anything that you accumulate here that's physical on this earth, you can't take with you. But praise the Lord that there is an afterlife. There is something afterwards. And souls of men, souls continue forever. Souls are something that is everlasting inherently. The soul of a person and the impact that you can have on individual souls going forward and being able to, one, lead other souls to Christ so that they um, can spend eternity with the Lord as opposed to being punished in hell, but also then impacting souls that are already saved to do more and to reach other people, right? And to just do even more and to do that labor and that work to help other people out. Those are all extremely valuable things in the eyes of the Lord. And those are the types of things that we are going to receive rewards for. Now, everyone here, I'm sure, would agree with me saying, do any of us deserve rewards when you think about being a sinner and, and, and deserving of hell? No, we, we, you know, we feel like, I don't deserve anything, but God exemplifies his free gift of salvation and exalts it so much by saying, it, you know, no matter how much work you do, none of it's going to be applied towards your salvation at all, which is why he gives us a reward for the work that we've done. So anything good that you do, any work that you do, he says, I'm going to pay you for that because salvation was free. But I don't want you to think in any way that you've sort of offset the price of your salvation that's already bought and paid for. So any good work you do, I'm just going to reward you for that. And that's, you know, and that's good news for us. It's, and it's another motivator as well. You know, there's lots of reasons that we should be motivated to do good. But one of those reasons is to receive a reward of God, right? That, that you, when you do the hard work, because it is hard work, because there is labor in serving the Lord, and there's sacrifices you're going to need to make in order to serve God, 
And, and it's going to be sometimes, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy on your schedule. It's not going to be easy on your sleep or whatever. Some things are going to make you uncomfortable to do, but it's all going to be worth it because God is going to give you a reward for it. Verse 15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And the title of my sermon this morning is Wood, Hay, and Stubble. Because remember, when I talk about redeeming the time and making the best use of your time, and while wood, hay, and stubble inherently aren't necessarily bad things, there's nothing wrong with sticks and wood. You know, I mean, we have houses that are made out of wood. There's nothing wrong with it except it just doesn't hold any real value. And that's what's being done here. We're not even, you know, this isn't even necessarily talking about sin, right? So when we're thinking about our lives and we're thinking about, well, how can I redeem my time? How can I view my life and, and the things that I do so that I can have as much value at the end of my life? You know, it's not just focusing on, well, what am I doing that's sinful? How about just what am I doing? Because the way that you spend your hours and day, uh, you know, you only have so much time to accumulate rewards and to do things for the Lord. And that's what we want to focus on. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to give you an example from the scripture of what I believe is, is an example of wood, hay, and stubble. And this is a, the story with, with Martha and Mary. Now, nothing that Martha or Mary are doing in this story is wrong at all. And, and they're, they're, they're actually you know, considered good things that are being done here. But there's a difference between the things that have more value and the things that are needful versus the things that are not. Look at verse number 38 in Luke chapter 10. The Bible reads, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And, you know, I think there's a lot of things that could be learned from just this real short story here. But one of the things that Jesus says to Martha, he says that thou art careful and troubled about many things. And we want to be careful that we're not so troubled about so many things that it distracts us from some of the most important things. Amen. Right? This is something we see with Martha. Now, is it bad that she's serving and ministering, especially to, to Jesus and other people? No, no, no. It's good. And he's not even saying that she shouldn't be serving or she shouldn't be helping. But she's, she's elevated that so much that when Jesus is actually, you know, you want to serve people and help people out. But when you've got Jesus there and he's teaching, you know, it's sometimes it's time to just stop with all the other work and to just come and sit and receive at Jesus' feet and receive what he has to give, right? And that is what's needful. He's saying, you know, what Mary is doing here is more important. She's receiving. She's listening. She's learning. She's spending her time close to Jesus, you know, as opposed to just being cumbered and troubled with all these other things that are going on. It's easy to get distracted in this life. It's easy to get distracted with things that aren't sinful, it's easy to get caught up in work and in other things, and you say, oh man, I've got all these chores around my house, and I've got this breaking and that breaking, and come over to my house. We've got things breaking all over the place. There's floors and doors and, you know, hedges and whatever. There's all kinds of things, all kinds of stuff that if I wanted to, I could just spend every waking hour just repairing and fixing and doing things. And you can say, well, is there anything wrong with that? No. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing sinful about, you know, doing all the things that you can do to, to maintain stuff. But if that's what you just, just focus on, you're going to ignore the more important things, right? And you could leave out the things that really matter in this life because I could, if I decided to spend my say, you know what? I can't prepare sermons. I can't go soul winning. 
I can't be praying and reading my Bible because, man, have you seen my house? I've got to fix this and this. And, and, and I could spend my whole life doing that type of thing. And I could get my yard so nice and there's not one, you know, one weed that's going to pop up is going to be gone, right? Before, before you even see it. Yeah, I'm going to get that done. And you, can, and you can have everything looking so nice and so pretty and so perfect and clean. And then you're going to die. And at the end of your life, there's going to be like, well, what, let's see what you did with your life. Here's all of this work that you did because you were busy. You did a lot of work, right? It'd be a lot of work to do that stuff. It's not like you're just lazy and doing nothing. You actually worked. You actually were building on your foundation. Unfortunately, all of that building, if that's how you're spending your life, is all wood, hay, and stubble. That's right. And just going to be burned up. Who's going to care about all that stuff when you get to heaven? Now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that to some degree, to some level. You know, I don't think you should just allow yourself to live in filth and in shambles and, you know, like... You should, you should care about your environment, surroundings, and family, and, and things like that, but it has its place, right? And it needs not to take the priority over the things that truly matter in your life. And this is why we all need to look at our time that we're spending and say, how am I spending my time? And I started off saying, you know, even things like entertainment is not a bad thing. I'm not saying you could never do anything fun or have any you know, way to, to kind of relieve stress. Just take a look at where is all of your time being spent, right? I mean, if Jesus were to show up like he did with Martha and Mary's house, he shows up to your house, it's more important to be right there with Jesus and to learn, say, what, do you, what, what can I learn from you? What can I get from you? What, you know, what, as opposed to just going around and doing this and doing that and doing all these other things, he said, yeah, you can have that stuff going on, but the majority of your time ought to be spent with Jesus, doing the right thing. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. Because just, just as easy it is, it is, personally, to get distracted with other things and to start getting involved in just spending all of your time doing stuff other things than what's really going to be valuable and what's really going to get, gain rewards at the end of your life. Uh, not just on an individual level, but on a church level, we have the same thing. And in Revelation chapter 2, we're going to see, Revelation 2 and 3 as warnings to the various churches that existed during this time. Um, and these letters were sent out. And these are all churches that God considered to be legitimate churches, right? They were, they were churches that God says, hey, they have a candlestick. They've got, you know, an angel that, that, is, that is helping and trying to be uh, guiding the churches in these various places. But with most of them, he's saying, hey, if you don't repent, you're not, I'm not going to consider you a church anymore. I'm going to take away a candlestick out of his place. Uh, let's look at what it says here in Revelation 2, verse number 1. To the church of Ephesus is unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast born and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted so is this a church that's working you better believe it. I mean, how many times you see, I know your works, I know your labor, I know you've born, you've been bearing things, you've been bearing burdens, you've had patience, you're dealing with things, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You're working, they're working hard. There's a lot of work going on at the church of Ephesus here. A lot of work. But notice what he says. He says, nevertheless, so in spite of all of this, in spite of all this work, I know all that's going on. I know you're making good stands. I know you're trying people. They say they're apostles or not. You're, you're wise. You're able to spot people who are deceivers and liars. You know, you're on your game in that regard. You're doing a lot of work. He says, but I still have somewhat against you because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, 
or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So the warning is if you don't go back to the first love, if you don't go back to the first works, I'm going to remove your candlestick. In spite of all of this other work that you're doing. Now, how many times he mentioned labor, working, like three or four times in those two verses? But what is his problem with? His problem is with the first works. So with all of this work that they're doing, they've left off the first work. They've left off the most important work that he's saying, if you're not doing this, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Let that stink in with how busy you may feel and all the things you may be laboring with and say, look, I'm not a lazy person. Good, amen. Because you ought not to be slothful. You ought not to be lazy. The Bible, you know, is very clear about that. Not to be a sluggard. Okay, you ought to be busy. You ought to be working. It's better than not working at all. But at the same point, what are you working on? What are you working for? What are you working with? These things matter too, and we don't ever want to lose sight of the most important things. When he's talking about the first love, the first work, I believe he's talking about soul winning. Amen. That is the first love. That is the first work. And he knows love and works are going together there. That first love, that first work of the church is to go out and reach the lost. And you think about churches that may have good doctrine. They may be able to spot the phonies. They may be doing a lot of stuff and keeping themselves real busy and being real active. And they've got active congregation and church members. Man, I'm involved with this and I'm involved with that and I'm doing this. But they're not doing any evangelism, any soul winning. And it's like, hey, look, it's great that you've got these programs and you're doing things and people are keeping real busy and you're not doing wicked things, and you're not doing sinful things, and you're laboring, and God can see all that labor that you're doing, but he's saying, you've gotten so caught up in everything else, you forgot about the most important thing. You've gotten distracted. You've gotten off point. And, you know, in the Christian churches, or, you know, Baptist churches are doing this when they start building schools, right, and, and, and building other programs and building all this stuff, and now that's where their finances are going, and that's what they're pushing, and that's what they're promoting, and get your kids in, you know, it's like, hold on a second. Are you going out and, and actually seeking and saving that which is lost? Are you going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Like, I know you're real busy with all this administrative stuff and all the school stuff, but don't forget the first works. Because if you do, God's saying, I'm going to remove your candlestick out of his place. I'm, not, I'm no longer going to even regard you as being a church that I'm going to try to work with and try to help and try to try to be you know be with you to do good. He's saying I'm just going to move on. Turn if you would to Acts chapter six, because this is a problem that we saw in Revelation chapter two. The church of Ephesus, I believe, was a real, it was a, was a very large church. It was a, it was a very big church, and. Um, What happens, especially as churches grow, is that it becomes easier, I think, to get distracted with other things going on. And, you know, from my perspective, you may not all have to deal with this. It's something I have to deal with, and I have to keep myself right on, too. So when I preach on sermons like this, this applies to me as much, if not more, <laughs> to everyone else. Because there's a lot of administration and things that go on with the church, a lot of programs I want to do, a lot of things I want to see done but I also need to be careful not to get caught up in everything else to where it's like, oh, no, I can't do any soul winning. And that's why if I have to do something different on a Sunday, I'm going to go soul winning on a different day of the week because I can't forget to do that. I mean, I can't just leave that off and say, well, I don't have time for that. I've got too many other things to do. And me is as much as anyone else. Okay, same thing, same boat. But in Acts chapter 6, we see here as the church in Jerusalem grows, um, verse number one of Acts 6, the Bible reads, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, so there's a lot of growth, right, reaching a lot of people, the disciples multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The widows that were supposed to be cared for by the church, hey, there's this daily work that's going on of supporting these widows and helping them with their needs and, you know, providing for them, and, you know, they have no one else to help them out, so the church is responsible and obligated to help them with these things. The church has grown so much that the Greeks are saying, hey, you know, 
maybe the Hebrew women who have been around for a long time, it's already been established and part of the pattern that they're going to be taken care of, but they said, no, we've got all these women that are widows that, that need help, that need, you know. So they start murmuring, going, you know, there's nothing being done here. And uh, so then it says here, verse 2, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So what they're saying is there's something more important that we need to be working on right now, that we're not going to leave the word of God. Now, it's not that this work doesn't need to be done. It is work that's, that's, that is important. It needs to happen. It needs to be done. They're not saying, well, no, forget it. You're just not going to be taken care of. They say, but we can't leave the job that we're doing right now to go and serve tables. It's, just, it's not reason. It doesn't make sense for us to go and stop what we're doing and do this, which, again, and this is where the church is, is able to, to help out and people are able to expand and get into other positions because if you've got only a handful of people that have to do all of the work, that's going to consume all of their time. So you have a really, let's see, thousands of people in a church and only a handful of staff of people who are able to just, you know, just, well, I have to, we have to do this, and we have to do this. So, you know, it, it's going to eat up all of your time so you're not able to do the more important things, which is why then they just get more people to help. So when you're able to distribute the workload among the people, then there's more time you can spend with other things. That's why I've been asking for help, and, and I thank you for everyone that does help and for with the cleaning and all the other tasks that just need to be done in order for our church to function. And I've had lots of people help out, and that is a huge blessing, but that's the only way that I'm going to be able to do other things and be able to read more and study more and be able to provide more for you and be able to keep myself doing the most important things is when we can have other people helping out and doing some of the other tasks that, yes, while they need to be done, you don't want to have one person just focus on doing all of that stuff and then not able to do the things that really are important. And we see that here in Acts, uh, Acts 6. So he says in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This is how they handle the situation. It would have been easy for them to just say, okay, well, I'll just do that job, and we just need, you know, because it all needs to be done, and it wouldn't be a bad job. But ultimately, it's not going to, you know, it's not the most important thing, right? And this is what we need to be able to balance our time with. And one of the things, I brought it up a little bit earlier, but turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. I think one of the biggest problems for people in general with getting their priorities right and, and doing time management revolves around money. In one form or another, right? Money. Well, we need to have more money for this. We need to have more money for that. We need to have more money to, you know, money can be a big distraction. Now, am I saying that money is, is just not important at all? No. Obviously, you need money to survive. You need money to buy clothing. You need money to buy food. You need, you need to have it. There's, there's a essential aspect of having some, you know, the, the, the resources be able to, to live and survive, right? It is necessary, but we need to be careful with our priorities to make sure that we're not focusing so much just on making money and forgetting the important things. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. The Bible reads, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So the things that you have here, the physical objects, the physical things that you may spend a bunch of time laboring for and working for, hey, I mean, someone could just come and steal that stuff. Someone could break into your house right now while you're at church, and take whatever things you've accumulated and, and whatever you've got locked up in your safe and what, you know, whatever, right? It can all just be eaten up or your house can burn up and burn to the ground. And then you don't have any of that stuff. He's saying, you know what you ought to be focused on? How about laying up yourselves treasures in heaven? Because the treasures, the rewards that you rack up for yourself in heaven, you don't lose those. You're not going to lose those. No thief is going to come through and steal those rewards. Those are sure those are, gonna, those are kept in a vault that no one, no one can, can get to, right? 
and that makes the most sense when you're be spending your time and working and laboring for something. How about something, you know, that, that retirement plan that's really going to pay off and you're not going to have to worry about losing it in a bad economy because God's economy is perfect. Amen. Verse number 21, the reason for laying up your treasure in heaven also is for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you spend your time laboring to be rich and laboring for goods and laboring for just to have accumulate a lot of wealth and a lot of money and a lot of things, your heart's going to be in that. When you're, when you're focused on the money and the things, well, now you're going to be more worried about the things than you are on the people or on the other things that matter, right? So if you're focused on the heavenly things, your heart's going to be with it too. It says in verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Money. That's what mammon is. It's just physical goods. It's money. You can't serve both. You're going to serve one or serve the other. You're going to have your heart on money. You're going to have your heart on God. You, but you can't have it simultaneously on both. You've got to choose what is important. And when you choose to serve God, you may or may not be blessed with finances. But that doesn't matter because you know what? Your heart's not in it anyways. It doesn't matter to you. It's like, who cares? And it, it's funny, I was talking to my wife about this from, you know, again, with my perspective, maybe 20 years ago, the things that have just happened recently, because my career, my, my, my worldly career that I have outside of this church is going really well. And it's like, that would have been extremely exciting 20 years ago for me. We've been like, oh man, this is great, and you know, it real excited, and now it's just kind of like, that's not <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice, but at the same time, like, I don't want that to distract me from the most important things because that's just one more opportunity to say, oh well, you can do this, and now you can make this much more money, and now you can you know, and have all these extra responsibilities. Like, I don't want that. Amen. I need to work. And I'm going to work hard at what I'm doing, and I'm going to, I'm going to you know, work as if I'm working for the Lord at the times when I'm at work. I think that's biblical and what we ought to do, but that's not where my heart is. My heart is in serving the Lord. And, and you know, we need to be careful with that because it's, it's so easy to be distracted. And for the shiny money, the shiny gold and silver, and the shiny things, and the, the shiny objects to, to catch your eye, and to start going after those things, especially when doors open up and opportunity, oh man, hey, look at, you can have this. Except it's just going to eat up all of your time. And you're going to start chasing after that, and if you achieve it, you're going to find yourself with an empty feeling. It's not going to be all that you built it up in your mind to be. It's not going to be as cool as you thought. Whatever, and that's one thing I've learned over time, is it, you know, as slowly we've gotten in a better place financially, it's just like all these things that you might have looked at when you were poorer, and then you finally achieve, it's like, it's just not all it's cracked up to be. It really isn't. I don't care what car you have. I don't care what thing you have. When you get it, it's just not that great. And the reason why I say that is because don't be deceived into making those things your focus. You're going to be disappointed, <laughs> not just in the object, but you're going to be disappointed then that why did I waste so much time pursuing this? Because you can't get that time back. No man can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you hold the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Referring to Gentiles is just the world. Right? This is what the world's seeking after. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What's he saying? He's saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God knows you need all that stuff. So we don't need to stress over the money, over the finances. You don't need to stress over where am I going to get my next meal. Now, is he saying don't do any work and don't labor? No. No, he's not just saying, well, just have faith and don't do anything, and God's just going to bring a basket down from heaven, and then you'll be able to eat. But he is saying that God's going to take care of you. So if you're doing what's right, we don't need to be distracted and, and go off into, some, you know, into just being so worried about all this stuff that, like, I need to drop everything and, and just do this other stuff. He's saying, no, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Make this a priority. Make serving God a priority. God knows you have needs. God can see your needs. God made you. He created you. He understands what it is to be a human being, and he knows what we need. He's taking care of the animals. Don't you think he's going to care about you even more than the animals? But look at what he's doing with them. They all get fed. They don't have to store up. They don't have to stock up. They don't even have to build these storehouses and do all this stuff. God still takes care of them. Don't get so focused on all this. Oh, man, but I just got to make sure I've got all this money saved aside and I got all this food stocked up and I've got it. Don't let that be a distraction for you. Focus on serving the Lord. God will God'll take care of the rest. Now, you still work, you still do what you need to do, but you, you, you don't, you know, that's not, that's not where your focus is. Turn, if you would, to Haggai, chapter 1. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn is Haggai. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you can know that God will take care of you. Amen. We know that. Jesus was teaching that. We see that. It's a fact. God will take care of you. You just have to have the faith to say, okay, well, Lord, I'm going to seek you first. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to church. I'm going to make sure I'm sowing. I'm going to make sure I'm doing the things that you want me to do that I'm not going to allow these other things to get in the way of serving you. That that is my priority. That is my priority over any other physical thing. And then God will make sure the rest happens. But if you, don't, if you decide not to take that mindset and not to take that attitude, you say, well, no, no, no. I need to make sure that my house and my stuff is taken care of first, and then I'll go and serve the Lord. If that's your mindset, you know what God's going to do? He's going to make sure that you never achieve what you're trying to achieve when you're putting yourself first above him. And we have, we have an example of this in Haggai. Look at chapter number 1, verse number 2. The Bible reads, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So he's talking about this people here. He's addressing. They're saying, You know what? It's not time to build God's house. It's not time for that. You know, that that's just going to come later. Now is, now is not the time to build the house of the Lord. Verse number 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? He's talking about the house of the Lord. He's saying, well, you've got your nice houses and your nice roof over your head, and it's time for you. Is it time for you to just go and spend your time in your nice houses and the house of God just, just lying in waste in disrepair and just, just neglected? Verse 5. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And this is, this is another theme of the sermon this morning. Consider your ways, because we're evaluating our time. 
We're valuing how we spend our time. We're trying to make most use of our time. We're trying to view our lives in a biblical way where we understand that God's going to have rewards for us, that wood, hay, and stubble are just going to be burned up anyways. Consider your ways. Are you investing too much time and too much energy and resources into things that don't matter, into your own sealed houses, and leaving the house of God in disrepair? How about just, the, just your own spirituality? Is that just, are you just leaving that off to the side Consider your ways. Look at verse number six. You have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. He's saying, yeah, you're working real hard. I mean, you're, you're, you're going out and you're sowing a lot, but you know what? You're not really reaping much, are you? Think there might be a reason for that? Yeah, you're focused on all the sowing, but you're not getting much. You're focused that you know, you're eating, but you never really feel satisfied. You're drinking, but you, again, you're not really being satisfied. You don't quite have enough. You're putting clothes on, but you know it's not really keeping you warm. You don't. You're not quite having enough of that either. And you're earning wages. And I love this this illustration. You're earning wages to put into a bag with holes, right? So you're saying like you got this sack of money, and you're like, man, I'm getting all this money, and you're putting it in your sack. But you don't realize there's just like, there's holes in it, so your money's just, just falling out and you're just losing it. It's just being completely wasted and gone. And it's not even being applied to something you, I mean, it's just, it's just being wasted. And he reiterates, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And you said that it wasn't time to repair the house of the Lord. You said, it was, you know, you're just focusing on yourself, but look at everything that you're doing, and it's not being blessed. In fact, not only is it not being blessed, it's being cursed. Because <laughs> they're sowing a lot of seed, but it's just not coming to fruition. They're making the money, but they're just, it's just being lost. And it's just seeming like, like where is it all going? What, it's disappearing. What's happening to it? Verse 8, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. So he's saying, you've got all this stuff, and when you actually bring it in, he's like, I'm just blowing on it and blowing it away and making sure that the works of your hands aren't going aren't to happen. Why? Why? Said the Lord of hosts. Because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man into his own house. Why? Because they weren't putting God first. Because they didn't put the priority on the house of God. They didn't pri put priority on the things that deserve the priority, on the things that are needful, on the things that we ought to be focused on, because when you focus on the wrong things and spend your time and waste your time on all this other garbage and nonsense and your house and all the other, and you're not paying attention to the house of the Lord, you're not paying attention to God's ways, it's all going to come to nothing. So I I'm going to leave you with this. It's foolishness. It's foolishness to say, as we saw in James, we started with, oh, today or tomorrow, or you know what? Next year, after I buy my new house and I get my new car and everything's settled, then I'm really going to focus on church. Let me do all this other stuff first. Let me get everything under control here. Then I'll start making it to more church services. Foolishness. Because in your efforts to do all that other stuff, God's going to be blowing on your work. Amen. You've got your heart in the wrong place. You've got your eyes set on the wrong things. You're building wood, hay, and stubble. And you know what? It's all just going to go away and be brought to nothing. You may enjoy it temporarily. But you're going to look back on your life and go, man, my life was just a vapor. And why did I waste so much time. Let's focus this month on trying to redeem our time and understand the value that it has and get our minds just refocused, reset, right? Praise the Lord, you're all still here, right? We're all still alive. We have time, so now let's reset our focus and get back focused on the right things. No matter what you've done yesterday or last week or last month or last year, let's get focused today. And, and move forward and say, you know what, I'm going to change some habits. I'm going to get rid of some wastes of time, the wood, hay, and stubble. I want to build gold, silver, and precious stones. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we thank you so much for all the, all the wisdom that you've given us in the Bible. Um, thank you for giving us the instruction that we need because we have such a short time here. Lord, help us not to be wasteful with our time, God. We, we want to serve you. We're your husband. We, we're your laborers, your Lord. Work with us and help us to do the things that are the most important. Help us to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be good examples. And God, help us just to, uh, to not be distracted with all the things and the cares of this world and, and the deceitfulness of riches, but help us to stay focused on the things that truly matters. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.